Jose Malena. So, on a very sunny morning in 2012, 62-year-old Jose Malena woke up ready and recharged to head to work. Malena arrived at the Bumblebee factory, probably thinking, just another day of the office. Little did he know, he was about to become the most famous sardine in the can. This was because this factory used a 35-foot-long pressure cooker to sterilize tons of tuna. That's literally the length of a school bus. Well, as the man started his daily routine maintenance, he crawled inside the oven to clean it when a co-worker, totally clueless that the man was inside, loaded it up with six tons of tuna and started the cooking process. The cooker was turned up to 270 degrees Fahrenheit with the man and fish trapped inside for the entire cooking cycle, which was a whopping two hours. Just imagine being trapped inside a hot oven set to the highest for two whole hours. Your blood and every single fluid inside your body would literally be at a boiling point while your flesh slowly sizzles and melts away from your body. Needless to say, the entire ordeal would have been horror personified for Milena. It gives a whole new meaning to the phrase, feeling the heat at work, doesn't it? Now, you might be thinking, surely someone noticed he was missing. Well, apparently his co-workers thought he had gone out for a quick lunch break. But unfortunately, Jose was busy pretty much becoming lunch himself. It wasn't until after the cooking cycle had ended when they went to retrieve the tuna that they discovered the tragic mistake. Jose's melted flesh was the only thing left of him. Tito Morales. Have you ever seen one of those movies where you're in an elevator and it suddenly stops working and people are panicking? Soon, some smart guy crawls out of the access hatch and gets to safety. This always seems to work in most movies, but sadly, this movie's plot took a complete U-turn when it came to 20-year-old Tito Morales. This sad incident happened in 2014 when the young man was heading out to a store after visiting his girlfriend in her apartment building. As he was riding in the elevator, it suddenly stopped, and of course, the doors didn't slide open. Instead of taking out his phone and calling for help, or maybe even hitting the emergency button on the elevator, Morales decided to unleash his inner Spider-Man. He used the access hatch at the top of the elevator to climb out, attempting to open the exterior doors to one of the floors, thinking he was in a real-life escape room. Unfortunately, just as Tito was playing Spider-Man, the elevator decided it wasn't done with its job and started moving again. Now, you'd think our hero would climb back inside and press the emergency button, right? Wrong. Tito decided to take his adventure to the next level, literally. He tried to jump onto the next elevator coming up, but surprise, surprise, he miscalculated and lost his footing. So instead of a smooth superhero landing, Tito found himself trapped between the elevator and the shaft wall, which essentially turned him into a human sandwich. Tito was unable to breathe for hours, and sadly, his lifeless body was the only thing that was pulled out. Francis Daniel Brome. So, Francis Daniel Brome and his best friend, John Hutcherson, had a yearly tradition that involved hitting up their local bar, drinking like it was the end of prohibition, and having a blast. One night in 2004, they got ready for their annual drink and meet, but things got really out of hand this time. After drinking enough to make a fish jealous, the dynamic duo decided to ignore the option of calling an Uber or Lyft like sensible drunks. Instead, they thought hitting the road completely wasted would be a brilliant idea. Because, you know, bad decisions are the cornerstone of every epic fail story. Well, Hutcherson took the wheel and Brome played the part of the passenger princess, merrily sticking his head and arms out of the window like he was living his best drunk Disney princess life. But this tale doesn't end happily ever after. Hutcherson, proving that drunk driving is never a good idea, lost control of the car. It swerved off the road and hit one of those wires that support telephone poles. The wire, clearly not in the mood for games, snapped up from the ground and went straight for Brome's head, which was still hanging out of the window. It cleanly decapitated him. Yep, like a scene out of a Final Destination movie. But here's where it gets even more surreal. Hutcherson, too drunk to notice that his best buddy was now missing a rather important body part, continued driving for another 12 miles. He parked, stumbled into his house, and went straight to bed, blissfully unaware that his friend was now headless in the car. Like, how drunk are you that you couldn't even notice the headless body hanging out your window? 
Forget that! How don't you even remember your best friend? Well, the next morning, the obviously very shocked neighbors spotted the headless corpse in the car and called the police. He was arrested and charged with drinking under the influence. Daniel Hill Daniel Hill was a 54-year-old working as a technician at a tube and pipe manufacturing company. It had not even been a year since he started working there when he left not just the company, but the world, and in the most horrific way. On that fateful day, Daniel was doing his technician duties, moving around, fixing and tightening all those loose bolts and screws. Just another day at the office, right? But fate had other plans for him. As he was making his rounds, he tripped and fell into a large open tank of 160 degree sulfuric acid solution. This wasn't your average hot tub, it was the company's very acidic, dangerous method for strengthening pipes. Now the thing is, sulfuric acid is so potent, it's nicknamed the king of chemicals and it is capable of dissolving other acids. Imagine a single drop of this stuff touching your skin. It would burn so intensely because it rapidly breaks down your skin, muscles, and bones. It's like having something voraciously eating away at your flesh. Now picture Daniel Hill's agony when he fell into this tank of extremely hot sulfuric acid. He was submerged in it for a few minutes before his co-workers, risking serious burns themselves, managed to drag him out. Daniel suffered extreme burns throughout his body and was rushed to the nearest hospital to get treatment. Sadly, he succumbed to his injuries after 11 hours of battling for his life. Summon Kundarura Just imagine you recently lost your mother and traveled all the way home for the funeral arrangements and burial. Well, that's all pretty normal, right? Unfortunately for 40-year-old Summon Kundarura, this simple normal tradition took a turn for the worst very, very fast. You see, it all happened on June 15th, 2018, while Kondorura was attending his mother's funeral in Sulawesi, Indonesia. So the tradition in his area is that the family members of the deceased would carry her coffin with the dead body inside to a decorated funeral tower that is about 10 meters high. This is the equivalent to a three-story building. Now get this, instead of strong wooden stairs, they were climbing a freaking bamboo ladder with the corpse and coffin. Because nothing says safe passage to the afterlife like a do-it-yourself jungle gym, right? However, the ladder obviously couldn't carry all the weight of the people walking on it, the corpse, and the coffin all at once, so it caved in, falling like a house of cards. And suddenly, everyone was getting a crash course in gravity, including mom and her coffin. It was raining men, and one very unfortunate woman in a box. The coffin fell out of their hands, did a few somersaults in the air, and wham, the coffin struck Simon Kundarura on the head. He landed on the floor with a fatal injury on his head and was declared dead as soon as he was rushed to the hospital. In a sick twist of events, the man who came home strong and healthy to bury his dead mother was literally killed and buried right beside her within 48 hours. Talk about a family reunion gone horribly wrong. Isadora Duncan Picture this. It is September 14th, 1927, and 50-year-old Isadora Duncan decided to drive around town in her new flashy convertible. Well, the free-spirited Isadora, dressed in her usual flamboyant style with a long, flowing silk scarf wrapped around her neck, entered the car and bid her friends goodbye. As she was driving, the trailing end of her scarf, fluttering outside the vehicle like a banner of freedom, suddenly got caught in the car's rear wheel. So as the car drove forward, the scarf just kept getting tangled and squeezing tightly around her neck. The scarf, now playing the role of the villain, powerfully pulled her head backwards and the force snapped her head backwards and her neck broke like a twig in a dry, sunny desert. Well, she died instantly. The scariest part of this tragic story was that before Isadora drove off, she literally said, goodbye, my friends, I am off to glory. Jesus Contreras Benitez. If you were working as a tree trimmer, then you'd be familiar with how dangerous some of the equipment is. And unfortunately, a certain Mexican immigrant called Jesus Contreras Benitez found out in a quite horrific manner just how dangerous the equipment is. On October 11th, 2022, Benitez and his crew were dispatched to handle the task. His specific job was to load the tree branches and trunks into a wood chipper. 
machine that can only be described as the mechanical equivalent of a giant kitchen blender, but designed to turn wood into chips instead of making smoothies. Although Benitez had been operating this machine for a while, feeding it large pieces of wood to break down into smaller chips with its sharp, powerful rotating blades, something went horribly wrong on this day, and in an instant Benitez somehow lost his footing or got too close, and the unforgiving wood chipper pulled him in. Just imagine being thrown into a machine with blades so strong and sharp enough to cut through thick trunks of trees. Well, the whole place was suddenly a pool of ground beef flesh, gushing blood, crushed bones, and brain matter. The exact details of how he fell in aren't clear, but these accidents can happen in a split second like slipping on a wet floor, but with far more catastrophic consequences. Kaiser Carlisle We can all agree that accidents happen all the time, but this particular freak accident would cause the tragic death of nine-year-old Kaiser Carlisle, who was just enjoying his day serving as a bat boy. In 2015, during the summer baseball game in Wichita, Kansas, Carlisle was doing what bat boys and girls do best, collecting falling bats and balls with the enthusiasm of a kid in a candy store. Sounds easy enough, right? Well, as it turns out, this gig was about to become much more dangerous than being a crash test dummy for monster trucks. On this particular hot afternoon, Carlisle was diligently working near the team's dugout when a player in the on-deck circle, essentially the VIP lounge for bats, decided to swing for the fences. Unfortunately, his bat ended up swinging towards Carlisle instead. Now, while all the bat boys and girls must wear helmets while working, this didn't do anything to protect Carlisle because the force of the baseball bat in full swing is approximately 10 times the impact of a hammer, but much faster. The blow shattered the helmet along with his fragile skull. He was immediately rushed to the hospital, but he died the next day due to severe head injuries. There are so many horrible ways people die every day, and if you want to stay updated on all the information and stories, please join our Discord server today. Suwan Laddie. Who would have thought that a termite infestation would be among the top worst ways to die in this day and time? Well, certainly not 54-year-old Suwan Ladi. You see, the man had a termite infestation at his home, so he decided to replace all the wood with a termite infestation single-handedly. As the proper handyman, Suwan decided to go full DIY warrior and replace all the infested wood. He had all his necessary tools ready and prepped for action. Nails? Check. Wood? Check. Termite repellent spray? Check. He even got an angle grinder, a power tool used for cutting, grinding, and polishing wood, iron, tiles, and scaffolding, which would help him reach the roof and higher places. The man was determined, and in his mind, nothing could possibly go wrong. After finishing the easy parts, it was time to tackle the wood beams. Suan climbed his homemade scaffolding like a modern-day Jack and the Beanstalk, but unfortunately, in a moment that could have been ripped straight out of a horror movie, he slipped and accidentally knocked over the angle grinder. As he fell, the power tool landed right on him, slicing through his neck and throat, cutting deep into his chest and spraying blood and bone everywhere. Unfortunately, Suan died on the scene after choking on his blood. Talk about a DIY gone wrong. Ara Garcia One early afternoon on New Year's Eve in 2013, Ara Garcia was walking on the Meridian Street Bridge in East Boston to attend a doctor's appointment. Now, this particular bridge she was walking on was like one of those movable bridges allowing boats to pass underneath like a transformer in disguise. So now, when she reached the intersection where the bridge usually split, a boat was trying to pass. Well, you can probably guess what happened after this. The bridge operator, probably daydreaming about New Year's Eve parties and resolutions they wouldn't keep, didn't notice our unfortunate pedestrian. Suddenly, Garcia found herself in a real-life game of The Floor is Lava, except in this version, the floor was actually disappearing. As the bridge began its impromptu yoga session, Garcia clung on like a cat to a curtain and started screaming for help. Finally tuning into this unscheduled horror show, the operator tried to lower the bridge faster than you can say oops. But in a twist that would make even the most sadistic game show host wince, this rescue attempt turned Garcia into a human panini. She was basically squished and flattened between the bridge plates, and it crushed her bones and organs. 
Eben Byers. Well, you already know that medicine in the medieval era was a mix of poison and a lot of trial and error, but one man who got the worst end of the pole was Eben Byers. Byers was a very wealthy industrialist and an amateur golf champion in the early 20th century, but he injured his arm in 1927 after falling from a railway couch. Now, instead of slapping on some ice and calling it a day, Evan's doctor prescribed him Radithor. It was the ultimate health craze, the supposed miracle elixir that could cure anything. Basically, it was water with a dash of radium in it. Yes, radium, the stuff that glows in the dark. Eben, being the overachiever that he was, didn't just sip this atomic cocktail. Oh no, he chugged it like a frat boy at his first beer keg. He was downing three bottles a day for two years. That's over 1,400 bottles of radioactive water. He'd have taken home the gold if there were an Olympic event for radium consumption. But alas, it turns out that drinking radioactive water isn't exactly good for you. By 1930, Evan started feeling a bit under the weather. And by a bit, I mean his teeth started falling out, his jaw developed necrosis, and his bones became so brittle they could have been mistaken for the aftermath of a cookie crumbling contest. Doctors were baffled at first, but soon realized Eben was practically glowing with radioactivity. He was suffering from severe radiation poisoning. His condition was so dire that, at the end, he had lost most of his jaw, parts of his skull, and had holes forming in his brain. It was like a bad sci-fi horror movie, except this was real life. Hugo Avalos Chanan it was another beautiful, bright morning when Hugo Avalos Chanan clocked into his job as a cleaner in a meat processing plant. And as the business world was about to start, Mr. Hugo, being the cleaner, was required to go and clean the meat grinder before it could be used for a new batch. Now, you'd think the first rule of cleaning a giant machine with sharp rotating blades that literally turn huge chunks of meat into tiny ground up pieces would be to make sure it's turned off, right? Well, Hugo missed that memo. Because immediately he climbed in to get to work, the meat grinder basically pulled him in and, true to its name, did its job. Well, let's just say he became part of the product line in the worst way possible. Talk about becoming one with your work. Another worker noticed what was happening and quickly turned off the machine, but it was already too late. The merciless blades had cut through Hugo down to his bones, which were now stuck in the grinder. The machine had to be taken apart piece by piece to get out Hugo's remains for his family to bury. Ronald Sear. So it's Thanksgiving Day in 2019, when Ronald Sear decided he wasn't going to rely on the usual locks, alarms, or friendly neighborhood watch to protect his home. So he came up with a brilliant idea to set up a device that would shoot anyone who tried to break into his house. Now, setting aside the fact that this sounds like something out of the Home Alone movies, Ronald actually went through with it. For the next two hours, the 65-year-old went through the stress of rigging a shotgun to his door in such a way that it would go off if anyone tried to force their way in. What Ronald didn't account for was the possibility of falling victim to his own ill-conceived trap. It's like setting up a tripwire in your living room and forgetting you're the one who put it there. On that fateful day, Ronald returned home and in a tragic lapse of memory opened his own front door, which triggered the booby trap he had so carefully crafted. The shotgun went off just as he designed it to, only it wasn't an intruder on the receiving end, it was Ronald himself. He managed to call 911, but the wound was fatal and he died a few minutes later from the very security system he had created. This is probably one of the worst do-it-yourself projects ever. Lottie Belk so you're at a picnic just enjoying a sunny day with friends and family when you suddenly spot a flying beach umbrella from your side eye headed directly toward your head. Well, this was exactly what happened to Lottie Belk during her 55th birthday celebration. It was July 2016 and Lottie Belk was celebrating her birthday with family and friends on the beautiful shores of Virginia Beach. While she was standing by the shore, probably taking in the ocean breeze, a strong gust of wind decided to make things interesting. Out of nowhere, a large beach umbrella, one of those big pointy ones designed to give you shade but apparently also great for impalement, took flight like it was auditioning for a scene in a horror movie. This umbrella wasn't just tumbling along the sand, it was airborne and headed straight for Lottie like it had a personal vendetta, and before she could even react, the umbrella impaled her right in the chest. 
And just like that, a beach umbrella went from being the perfect sunshade to a deadly <gasps> weapon that killed a poor woman on her birthday. Irma Bulli. If, in the unfortunate event, you come across a venomous snake and it bit you, the next thing you'd most likely do is seek medical attention before the venom kills you immediately. Well, not according to Irma Bulli. So basically, the 29-year-old Indonesian singer loved performing on stage with dangerous animals because she was a daredevil and singing alone wasn't enough entertainment. On this particular day, on April 3rd, 2016, she brought a breathing, venomous king cobra on stage with her and guess what? She stepped on the freaking cobra tail while performing, so of course, the snake bit her. Now this is where it gets absolutely stupid because Irma just kept on singing like nothing happened. To make matters worse, she even rejected the antidote that the snake's handler tried to give her and kept singing as if being bitten by a venomous snake is the same as a mosquito bite. The poison obviously coursed through her body and 45 minutes later, while she was still performing, she started vomiting and having seizures and you guessed it, she died. Well, at least she gave a once in a lifetime performance to her audience. It's not every day you go to a concert to watch someone get bit by a snake and die. Gary Hoy On July 9, 1993, Gary Hoy, a 38-year-old corporate lawyer from Toronto, worked in a high-rise building called the Toronto Dominion Centre. The building was known for its unbreakable glass, and Hoy was known for being a bit of a showman, especially when it came to proving a point. So, in a spectacular display of poor judgment, Hoy decided to demonstrate the strength of these windows to a group of visiting law students. As he had done many times before, he ran at the window full force, throwing his body against the glass. After all, what's the best way to show off the unbreakable glass? Well, by trying to break it, of course. He had clearly missed the memo about not using yourself as a crash test dummy. Well, things took a tragic turn fast, because while the glass itself didn't actually break, it popped out of its frame entirely. So instead of just bouncing off like he usually did, Gary and the entire window were sent plummeting 24 floors down. If there was anything that shattered, it was his own judgment about the windows, and of course, all 206 bones in his body as he crashed. Sadly, this window of opportunity turned into a 100% fatal mistake, but at least he still proved his point. The glass was indeed unbreakable. Jennifer Strange In 2004, Jennifer Strange, a 28-year-old mother from California, entered a radio contest called Hold Your Wee for a Wee. The contest, hosted by a local Sacramento radio station, had a simple and now infamously dangerous premise. Participants had to drink large amounts of water without going to the bathroom. The last person standing, or rather sitting, without breaking the seal, would win a Nintendo Wii, which at the time was one of the hottest gaming consoles on the market. Jennifer, like many parents at the time, was eager to win the Wii for her kids, so she took part in the contest. As the contest went on, Jennifer consumed more and more water. Unfortunately, the radio hosts and contestants didn't realize that drinking excessive amounts of water in a short period can be incredibly dangerous and lead to a condition known as water intoxication or hyponatremia. In simple terms, when you drink too much water too quickly, it dilutes the sodium in your blood. Sodium is crucial for maintaining the balance of fluids in and out of your cells. When there's not enough sodium, your cells start to swell with water. In the brain, this swelling can be fatal, as the skull prevents the brain from expanding. After the contest, Jennifer started to experience severe headaches, nausea, and disorientation, classic signs of hyponatremia. Tragically, just hours after returning home, she passed away. A classic case case of too much of everything being bad. The craziest part about all this is that she didn't even win the challenge. Basil Brown so, every healthy eating, healthy living advocate is always trying out new healthy smoothies or meal plans to improve their general well-being. Eating fruits, vegetables, and drinking a ton of water is, after all, the secret to a healthy life. Well, unfortunately for Basil Brown, this wasn't the case. You see, this man was obsessed with being healthy and was determined to boost his wellness by any means necessary. 
And so, of course, he started eating fruits. Not just any fruit, though. He was mainly eating carrots. He would eat them, turn them into smoothies, and drink them. This guy drank at least one full gallon of carrot juice daily. Now, even though drinking carrot juice gives your body nutrients and vitamin A, which is great for your eyes, immune system, and skin, taking four liters of carrot juice daily was definitely not a good idea. It was a very fatal idea. The excessive consumption of carrot juice basically overloaded his body with vitamin A, which became toxic. It's like getting alcohol poisoning, but this time it's vitamin A poisoning. Soon his skin started turning yellow and he developed severe liver damage within 10 days of his carrot juice obsession. He died soon after, which goes to prove the fact that, again, too much of everything is actually really bad. Unfortunately, Basil learned this the hard way. If you want to find out more stories like this, then you should join our Discord server today. Michael Anderson Godwin can you imagine escaping execution by electrocution only to end up still dying in the most stupid way possible? Well, this is precisely what happened to Michael Anderson Godwin, a convicted criminal who had been sentenced to death for murder in South Carolina. Initially, he was supposed to be executed in the electric chair. However, after some legal wrangling, his sentence was reduced to life in prison. So, in a sense, he managed to avoid the electric chair, something which most people would consider incredibly fortunate. Fortunate. Well, unfortunately for Michael, fate had other plans. One day in 1989, while serving his life sentence, Godwin was in his prison cell, likely going about his day like any other. He was sitting on a metal toilet while trying to fix his TV set. Godwin bit into a wire connected to his television set while still seated on the metal toilet for reasons that can only be described as tragically unlucky. Now, if you know anything about electricity, you'll know that metal conducts it quite well. The combination of the metal toilet and the exposed wire created a perfect circuit, and Godwin was electrocuted on the spot. The irony? He died from electrocution on a chair, the very fate he had managed to escape in the courtroom. Gary Anderson If you visit any construction site, you will know that the number one rule is always to wear a safety helmet. It is a rule that everyone is supposed to follow, most especially the construction workers. However, this rule was just a mere suggestion for Gary Anderson because he never wore his safety helmet. Well, in November 2014, the 58-year-old construction worker was delivering drywall to a construction site in Jersey City, and as usual, he didn't have his safety helmet on. So, while he was deeply engrossed in his work, another worker on the 50th floor mistakenly dropped their one-pound measuring tape, which fell nearly 500 feet at 140 40 meters per hour before striking Gary Anderson's head. Talk about hitting the mark. He immediately collapsed to the ground and was rushed to the Jersey City Medical Center, where he suffered from cardiac arrest and died two hours later. Who would have thought that a measuring tape could become a deadly weapon? Well, definitely not Anderson. Carl Berry. Picture this. It's a sunny day in April 2013, and Carl Berry, a hockey player, is practicing with other teammates on the field when he sees a snake slithering nearby. Now, the normal normal response to seeing a snake is to slowly back away and try to contact animal services or an expert, right? Well, not according to Carl, who walked directly to the snake and picked it up without fear. He planned to actually throw the snake out of the field so it wouldn't bother their practice. But unfortunately for him, he had just picked up a King Brown, which is literally one of the most venomous reptiles in the world. Needless to say, the snake bit him and Carl flung it away. At least he still achieved what he initially wanted to do. Now, you'd expect that Carl would alert others that he's been bitten by a snake or try to seek medical attention, right? Well, that's wrong because the guy just continued with practice like nothing happened. Sadly, after he'd run for about two kilometers, he started feeling very dizzy, tired, and nauseous, and before you knew it, he collapsed. When first responders arrived, Carl was pronounced dead on the scene. Sulawesi Farmers The year is 2017, and five hardworking farmers in Sulawesi, Indonesia, are going about their day tending to their crops and doing the usual farm work. Now, on the farms, they have this massive wooden barn for storing their corn, and the barn is also built with a huge empty space underneath where they can eat and rest occasionally. One day while working, it started to rain heavily, so these guys ran to take cover underneath the barn, but in a twist of events that could only be called a tragedy, the wooden barn started to sway violently. 
This caused a mountain of corn to come crashing down on these guys. We're talking about the weight of three tons of corn. It's like getting buried under a runaway semi-truck made entirely of corn kernels. They remained there for several hours and the weight eventually started to cut off their oxygen supply. Sadly, before the other farmers around noticed the disaster, the lack of oxygen and heavy weight on top of them had already killed them. Imagine going to do such hard work morning and night only to end up getting killed by what should have been their reward. Edward Archbold If you were to buy a burger from a food truck and discover a cockroach in it as you were about to eat it, you'd be furious and throw the whole thing away. But for someone like Edward Archbold, that was a very delicious appetizer. You see, this guy has a thing for eating bugs, and he literally entered a roach eating contest to see who could eat the most live roaches. Now, just like in every contest, Contest, there is always a prize for the winner, and you wouldn't believe that the prize for this already fucked up contest was a python. Yeah, eat live cockroaches and win a snake. So, as the contest started, Edward went all in. He wasn't just nibbling on the roaches, he was shoveling them into his mouth like he was at an all-you-can-eat buffet, and he was winning. Edward didn't know that cockroaches aren't exactly smooth going down, so in his bug-eating frenzy, he didn't seem to consider that his throat might not be as thrilled about the menu as he was. Well, the cockroach diet clogged his airway and he started choking. Sadly, what was supposed to be a glorious moment of triumph quickly turned into a fight for air and, sadly, the bugs won. Edward's prize-winning strategy backfired in the worst possible way, and he suffocated from what can only be described as the world's most bizarre snack. Well, at least he didn't get bitten by a python. Lee Sims As a child, when you and your mom or dad go to the park and you want to ride the swing, they'd swing you for only a few minutes before getting tired and asking you to, you know, play on something else. And, as fun as riding a swing is, it was unfortunately the worst day of three-year-old Lee Sims' life, and quite literally, the end of it. In 2015, Ramesha Sims took her son Lee Sims for a spin in a park in Maryland. The boy wanted to ride the swing, so she started swinging him gently for a few minutes, and then it turned into hours, and those hours turned into days. This lady kept pushing her child on the swing for a total of 40 hours, never taking a break. It was almost like she was hypnotized and stuck somewhere else. When someone finally noticed what was actually happening and called the police, the poor boy was already unconscious because of dehydration and hypothermia. Lee Sims was dead before he even got to the hospital, and his mother, well, it turns out she was mentally unwell and didn't even know where she was or what she'd done. Darren Rainey if you've ever had the misfortune of getting scalded by hot water, you might have a tiny inkling of the unimaginable pain that Darren Rainey endured. But even that pales in comparison to the horrific ordeal he went through. So, Darren was a 50-year-old inmate with schizophrenia serving time at Dade Correctional Institution in Florida struggling with schizophrenia. In June 2012, after he defecated in his cell, the guards decided they'd punish him in a way that would make medieval torturers wince. They forced him into a tiny shower stall, turned on the scalding hot water, and locked him inside. For over three excruciating hours, Darren was subjected to water temperatures reaching a searing 82 degrees Celsius. That's just 18 degrees shy of boiling point. To put it bluntly, the man was practically cooked alive, with the water relentlessly pouring down on him like he was a lobster in a pot. When other inmates finally discovered Darren, what they found was more reminiscent of a horror movie than reality. His body, still under the running water, was red and blistered, the skin peeling off like a grotesque version of fruit roll-ups. The burns covered 30% of his body, ranging from second to third degree. The guards basically forgot they had locked a living, talking human being under extremely hot water and not a fish. If you're wondering why Darren couldn't just turn off the shower or at least reduce the temperature of the water to save himself, well, it's because the shower he was locked in was rigged. The controls were in another room far out of reach for any inmate. As for the guards who subjected Darren to such inhumane torture, they were sadly never prosecuted, never punished, and never held accountable for their actions. Richard Molesky now, Richard was the proud owner of the Tullum Monkey Sanctuary in Mexico, where he kept all sorts of exotic animals, from mischievous monkeys to a 550-pound camel. 
Now, if you were to bet on which animal might cause some trouble, the monkeys would be the obvious choice. But in a plot twist out of a dark comedy, it was the camel who decided it was time to take matters into its own hooves. Apparently, Richard had been keeping the camel penned up with food and water for days. Well, in October 2014, the camel quite literally decided that enough was enough. Hungry and extremely angry, the camel knocked Mr. Richard to the ground and then proceeded to stomp on him over and over again. With each stomp, the camel broke nearly every bone in Richard's body, shattering his skull and crushed his vital organs like a bag of chips under a heavy grocery bag. But the camel wasn't done making its point. Just to drive the message home, it bit Richard a few more times for good measure and then sat on him as if to say, and stay down. Tragically, Richard didn't survive this camel's revenge because he died on the spot. Even after Richard's life had ended, the camel wasn't ready to relinquish its new seat. It continued to sit on Richard's lifeless body, refusing to move until emergency services arrived. The rescuers had to tie the camel up just to get to Richard. Well, this whole incident gives a whole new, painfully literal meaning to the phrase, the straw that broke the camel's back. Except in this case, it was the camel who did all the breaking. Svetlana Roslina Svetlana Roslina was a 24-year-old mother of two who worked at a chocolate confectionery factory near Moscow. Now, while most people worry about gaining a few pounds working around sweets all day, Roslina's work ended in a way that no one could have imagined, and it was far more horrifying than any diet dilemma. So on that fateful day, after kissing her kids and husband goodbye, Roslina went off to work. Like every other day at work, they would produce thousands of pieces of chocolates. As part of the production process, the chocolates are usually mixed in a giant mixer while it is still in its liquid form. Roslina's job was simple enough, stand near the giant mixer and keep an eye on the swirling molten chocolate. But as anyone who's ever stood on the sidelines knows, watching chocolate spin around can get pretty boring, so to pass the time, Roslina decided to pull out her phone. Maybe to crush some candies in Candy Crush, or to check in with her husband to see how the kids were doing. But, as fate would have it, the phone slipped from her hand and fell straight into the giant mixer. Instinctively, Rosalina reached out to catch it, but in doing so, she lost her balance and tumbled headfirst into the vat of hot, thick chocolate. In a horrific turn of events, she found herself upside down with her head and upper body submerged in the boiling chocolate mixture. The giant mixer, oblivious to the human tragedy, continued its relentless spinning, grinding Rosalina's head and upper body along with the chocolate. By the time a co-worker came to check on her, all that remained visible were her legs, eerily floating atop the swirling, now tragically tainted with chocolate. When her remains were dragged out, it was confirmed that the upper parts of Rosalina's body had unfortunately become chocolate pudding. Sam Ballard so picture this, it's 2010 and you decide to go outside to play with your friends. Now, as teenagers, you're all having a blast, being silly and making a lot of questionable decisions when one of your friends dares you to do the impossible, swallow a garden slug. Now, the sensible thing to do would be to say no, but that wasn't what Sam Ballard did. Instead, the 19-year-old rugby player from Sydney, being the daredevil that he is, picked up the squiggly, slimy, disgusting slug and popped it into his mouth. He swallowed the entire thing whole. Unfortunately, aside from being a very disgusting snack, the tiny, unassuming slug was carrying a deadly parasitic worm known as rat lungworm, which usually hangs out in rats' lungs, but sometimes it takes a vacation in slugs and snails. When Sam swallowed the infected slug, he basically sent a VIP invitation for the worm to have a rave in his brain, and, well, the rave consisted of the infection eating away part of his brain, lungs, and liver. After a couple of weeks, Sam started to get really sick. He couldn't walk, talk, or even stand up from bed. And as his condition got worse, he fell into a coma for 14 long months. But when he woke up, he was paralyzed from the neck down. He was bound to a wheelchair and was unable to eat without a tube. He now required 24-hour care seven days a week and was prone to severe seizures. The young man couldn't even go to the bathroom without help and was also unable to control his body temperature. Sadly, he died eight years later at the age of 28. Rosa King So it's another typical day in May 2017 for 33-year-old Rosa King. 
Like clockwork, she woke up before her alarm, full of energy and ready to take on the world, or more specifically, the Hammerton Zoo Park in Cambridgeshire, England, where she worked as a zookeeper. Sadly, this would be the day her passion would meet an untimely and very toothy end at the paws of a Malayan tiger named Sisip. As Rosa entered the tiger's enclosure to do her routine cleaning, things took a sharp turn for the worse. Perhaps Sisip woke up on the wrong side of the straw bed that morning because it was extremely temperamental and apparently in no mood for housekeeping. In a split second, it pounced on Rosa and tore her limb from limb like a child's rag doll. The tiger literally tore into her flesh, cracking and snapping her bones like twigs and biting out huge chunks of her skin and muscles. The whole attack was like something out of a horror movie, and it was swift and brutal and destructive. Rosa was left with multiple fractures and a severed spinal cord. Tragically, she died on the scene. Just imagine the agony of death, where you feel every excruciating second as your bones splinter and your flesh is violently ripped apart. Her body was discovered a few hours later by a zoo visitor who looked into the enclosure from the public viewing area and raised the alarm. An investigator later revealed that the zoo had some, let's call them relaxed safety protocols because someone had mistakenly left the metal slide that was designed to isolate the animals open. Turns out that letting humans and tigers mingle freely isn't the best idea. Who knew? Rajesh Maru. So in January 2018, Rajesh Maru decided to visit a relative in the hospital. But little did he know that same relative would soon be visiting him in the morgue. Talk about a twist of fate straight out of a horror movie. The thing is, Rajesh was visiting in the MRI room of a hospital in Mumbai, India. If you've ever been near an MRI machine, you know that they're essentially giant magnets on steroids. And what do magnets do? They attract metal. So Rajesh unfortunately didn't get the memo, or rather he was given the wrong one by hospital staff who assured him that the MRI machine was off. Following instructions, Rajesh entered the room carrying a metal oxygen cylinder. However, the moment he stepped into the room, the MRI machine, which was actually on and ready to rumble, locked onto that oxygen cylinder like it was a long lost friend. What happened next was like a deadly game of tug of war, but with Rajesh caught in the middle. The machine pulled both Rajesh and the oxygen tank toward it with incredible force, but unfortunately the oxygen tank got damaged and the liquid oxygen gas inside started leaking into the small enclosed MRI room. Liquid oxygen is very, very harmful to humans, and breathing in a lethal amount can cause instant lung damage, which would, in turn, cause instant death. His lungs burned as the gas ravaged his tissues, causing unbearable pain with every breath. His chest tightened, muscles tensed, and his vision darkened as his body shut down from the violent damage. Sadly, this was the fate of Rajesh. De Leon Alonzo Smith We've all heard the phrase, shoot for the stars, in almost every motivational speech that was ever made. It's supposed to inspire you to aim high, chase your dreams, and all that good stuff. But 19-year-old De Leon Alonzo Smith took that phrase a little too literally and in the worst possible way. It all started in September 2019 when De Leon decided it was time to up his selfie game. His Instagram profile needed a boost and he wanted to look bad for the ladies. Now, a boring old pouty face or peace sign wouldn't cut it. Those are for amateurs, right? So his bright idea was to pose with a freaking loaded gun, because, you know, nothing says I'm cool like holding something that could end your life in a split second. While trying to take the perfect selfie with the firearm, De Leon accidentally pulled the trigger and, well, the gun went off. The bullet went straight to his throat and shattered the major veins and arteries in his neck. It was the ultimate photobomb gone horribly wrong. De Leon was found in the bedroom of his apartment by the paramedics who pronounced him dead. He literally died trying to take the perfect shot. The irony. There have been so many painful ways people have tragically lost their lives, and if you want to know how to avoid such dire situations, then join our Discord server today. Aurora Chaffel. So picture this, you're at the beach, the sun is shining, and you spot the perfect rock for that Instagram-worthy photo, so you head down to stand on it. Because what could possibly go wrong? Well, unfortunately for Aurora Chaffel, everything. 
In March 2017, Aurora was enjoying spring break with her friends at a beach in Oregon. Like most teens, she probably had her mind set on capturing that perfect moment for social media. She found a large log near the water's edge and decided it was the ideal spot for her photo op, nature's perfect prop. But as we all know, Mother Nature has a way of reminding us who's really in charge. As Aurora perched on the log, ready for her close-up, the ocean decided to play a cruel trick. A sneaker wave, which is an extremely large and unpredictable coastal wave, suddenly appeared out of nowhere. Before Aurora knew it, the log she was standing on shifted, trapping her legs underneath it. Her friends and bystanders rushed to help, desperately trying to free her, but just as they were making an effort, the ocean sent another wave crashing in. This time, the log rolled completely over Aurora's body, snapping and crushing every bone in her body. It was a moment of sheer horror. By the time the paramedics arrived and managed to free Aurora, it was already too late. The very feature of nature she sought to capture had claimed her life. For the sake of a photo, what was supposed to be a fun day at the beach quickly turned into a nightmare. Francois Alexi. When you were a kid, you probably believed that Santa Claus could slide down chimneys with ease to drop off your gifts under the Christmas tree. But for one unfortunate soul, Francois Alexi, his chimney adventure turned out to be far from jolly and there wasn't a single reindeer in sight. Now, most London apartments have chimneys, including the building where Francois and his friends were partying on a rooftop of a 70-story building in a London apartment. The unfortunate incident started when he decided to take a break and enjoy a cigarette. He perched himself on the chimney, but this wasn't the best seat in the house. Somehow, Francois managed to fall right into the chimney, and unlike Santa, he didn't have a magic sack to soften the blow. He tumbled down the narrow 100-foot-long shaft, hitting his head several times on the way down, fracturing bones, and eventually getting stuck near the bottom. It was like the world's worst roller coaster ride with brick walls for bumpers. When his friends realized he wasn't coming back from his smoke break, they started looking for him. That's when they discovered Francois wedged at the bottom of the chimney and immediately called for help. Firefighters arrived and spent a grueling five hours trying to free him, carefully dismantling the chimney brick by brick. It was like playing the world's most morbid game of Jenga. Despite their efforts, the situation was dire. Francois didn't survive the fall. The multiple broken bones, the trauma from the tumble, and the time he spent trapped in the dark, narrow shaft were too much for him to endure. Alex Bestler Let's say you and your friend decide to go on a hike in Usury Mountain Regional Park in Arizona. But as you're taking pictures and walking up the beautiful trail, you suddenly find yourself in the middle of angry bees. We're not talking about a few annoying buzzers here. This was the insect equivalent to release the kraken. Except instead of one mythical beast, it was thousands of tiny, angry, stinging bees. Ironically, these bees are also known as killer bees. Well, this is exactly what happened to 23-year-old Alex Bessler and his friend on May 26, 2016. While Alex's friend managed to run to safety, Alex got caught in what can only be described as nature's version of a drive-by. These angry, stinging bees went to town on poor Alex, stinging him over 1,000 times. That's right, a thousand. Just imagine how painful just one single bee sting is, and then picture a literal army of these guys just stinging you over and over and over again. When rescue workers finally arrived, they found Alex literally covered in bees. The situation was so intense that they had to vacuum the bees off him just to get close enough to help. But despite their efforts and the quick response, the sheer number of stings was too much. Tragically, Alex didn't survive the attack. Brooke Bowers just imagine clocking in at your job as a bartender and thinking the most dangerous thing you'll encounter is an overly rowdy customer or at worst a hangover that could knock out a herd of elephants. But for Brooke Bowers, fate had a plot twist in store that no amount of aspirin could cure. It all happened in December 2021 when the 21-year-old Brooke was working at a bar called Coasters in Wisconsin Dells, Wisconsin. Now, this place had a neat little feature called a dumbwaiter, which is basically like an elevator's tiny cousin, perfect for ferrying food, drinks, and other supplies between floors. Well, on this fateful night, this device became anything but dumb. For reasons that remain unclear, Brooke climbed into the dumbwaiter, but unfortunately, the thing moved, and she was literally trapped inside with no way to crawl out. 
It was like being trapped inside a tiny box made out of metal and concrete. Unfortunately, fate being the cruel jokester it is, decided to make sure nobody noticed for hours. Well, there was literally no oxygen coming into the tiny middle box, and poor Brooke spent her last hours gasping for air. Brooke tragically died from suffocation, which is quite literally a very slow and painful way to go. Death by Laughter, Zeus. You've probably used or heard the expression dying of laughter. Well, it turns out Zeus, the famous Greek painter in the 5th century, took that figure of speech way too literally. You see, Zeus was good at creating hyper-realistic paintings that made people question if they were looking at art or the real thing. Think of him as the ancient world's Michelangelo, before Michelangelo was even a twinkle in history's eye. His art was so lifelike that according to legends, birds would try to eat the fruit he painted. So, of course, people came from far and wide to have him paint them. Now, there was this old lady who commissioned Zeus to paint a portrait of her, but make her look like Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love and beauty. But there was one tiny problem. This lady, bless her heart, was far from the goddess-like ideal she envisioned. She wasn't exactly Aphrodite material, to put it mildly. But hey, Zeus, being a professional, got to work. He painted the elderly woman in all her unique glory. And when he unveiled the portrait, he found the thing so ridiculously absurd, this massive contrast between the woman's request and her actual appearance, that he broke into uncontrollable laughter. To Zeus, the sheer ridiculousness of the situation was just too much. The contrast between the elderly woman's modest appearance and the image of her as Aphrodite was like painting your cat as a lion and expecting people to believe it. The whole thing was so far-fetched that it tickled his sense of humor. We're talking rolling on the floor, peeing your pants, can't catch your breath kind of laughter. The poor guy couldn't just stop, and eventually, his heart literally couldn't take the strain of his own amusement, and he supposedly died in a fit of laughter right then and there. Talk about art that kills, or in this case, the subject of the art. Molasses Flood, Boston, 1919. If you had told the 21 people who died in the Boston Molasses Flood of 1919 that they'd meet their end drowning in a river of sweetener, they probably would have laughed in your face and then asked if that sweetener came with pancakes. So the tragedy started one very chilly day in January while people were just going about their day when all of a sudden there was a loud rumbling sound as if a hundred machine guns were firing at the same time but far from it. Apparently, it was the sound of a 2.3 million gallon tank of molasses rupturing due to the tank's inferior construction and a sudden temperature change. As the massive storage tank bursts open, it unleashes a tsunami of sugary goop onto the streets. We're talking about a 15-foot high wave of molasses moving at 35 miles per hour like some sort of mutant pancake syrup from a horror movie. This stuff was practically knocking down buildings, lifting a whole train off its tracks. It would have been a funny scene uh, trying to escape a tsunami of pancake syrup. But people, animals, and buildings got trapped in the goo, struggling like flies and amber, those who couldn't make it out. This freak accident drowned and claimed the lives of 21 people and left 150 people with serious injuries. The cleanup took weeks, and even a decade later, some people say they can still smell the molasses lingering on hot days like some kind of sweet, sticky ghost haunting the city. This disaster literally gave birth to the expression, as slow as molasses in January. Death by Beard, Hans Steiniger, 1567. So, chances are you have had a really bad hair day at least once in your life. You know, when you wake up in the morning and it feels like your hair is out to get you, and no matter what you do, you just can't seem to get it to cooperate. Well, one man named Hans Steiniger took the concept of a bad hair day to a whole new level, and unlike you, his hair did get him, literally. Basically, in 1567, in a small Austrian town, Hans Steiniger was the proud owner of a 4.5-foot-long facial masterpiece. He walked around town like he was the king of beards. The thing was so impressive that he would have probably ended up in the Guinness Book of World Records today. Now, as maintenance, Hans would keep his beard neatly rolled up in a leather pouch. However, on this fateful day, he decided to let his full mane feel the breeze, probably feeling like a lion. 
Well, on his way back from the local store, a fire broke out in a nearby house, and in his rush to help, Hans literally tripped over his own beard, which is entirely possible when your beard is practically the same height as you. Hans tumbled down the stairs of the burning building, breaking his neck in the process. Just like that, the beard that had been his pride and joy literally became his downfall. It's like the ultimate, your greatest strength is also your greatest weakness. But with way more facial hair and poor Hans died as he lived, wrapped up in his glorious beard. Cursed Theater Costume Alan Pinkerton, 1884 So, it's 1884 and Alan Pinkerton, the founder of the Pinkerton Detective Agency, is living his best life. This guy is basically the 19th century version of James Bond, minus the fancy gadgets, but he still made it work. Like, he solved so many cases, saved Abraham Lincoln from assassination uh, once, and was basically every outlaw's worst nightmare. However, he was getting really old, but instead of retiring, to a quiet life of fishing and napping in a rocking chair like any normal old guy, Alan decided that he wasn't ready to take the bow. He took a role in a local theater production, and although his new line of work wasn't as exciting as solving crimes and getting shot, it was still something. One fateful day, as Alan was struggling to put on his theater costume, he slipped on the floor and bit his tongue. Now, normally this would be nothing more than an embarrassing moment that you laugh off while drooling for a bit. But Alan wasn't so lucky. The bite was bad enough to make his tongue bleed, and he brushed it off like the tough detective he was. But a few weeks later, the small wound turned into a much bigger problem. His tongue got infected, and, well, it was the 1880s, so the best medical care probably involved a handful of leeches and a doctor crossing his fingers. The infection spread, turning into gangrene, and just like that, the guy who stared down criminals, saved a president, and lived through some some wild times was taken out by his own tongue. It's like dying from a paper cut, only more dramatic. Death by Parasol Henry Taylor, 1874 So picture this. It's the evening of August 1874 in London, and esteemed lawyer Henry Taylor is going to the courthouse. The sky suddenly goes full apocalypse mode, clouds turning pitch black and winds gusting so hard it can make a kite blush. While everyone around him is flailing about like cartoon characters caught in a cyclone, Taylor tightens his grip on his hat, determined to power walk his way to legal greatness. Nothing, not even Mother Nature's tantrum, was going to derail his courthouse crusade. Amidst this chaotic windstorm, a woman in front of Taylor is wrestling with her parasol, a high fashion umbrella from the era. The wind decides it's had enough of her fancy fashion and yanks the parasol right out of her hands. The metal-tipped end of this flying fashion statement then takes a direct route to Henry Taylor's eye, turning his stroll into an impromptu horror show. And this wasn't just a minor poke, oh no. The parasol went full medieval joust and punctured through his eye, piercing his brain like it was aiming for the bull's eye in a twisted game of darts. Despite the medical team's heroic efforts to salvage him, Taylor's fate was sealed. The wound, now a festival of infection and decay, proved too much. A few days later, he succumbed to his parasol-induced misfortune. Talk about a tragic way to get an eye-opening experience. Execution by Elephant, Ancient India In today's world, if you were convicted of a crime with a death sentence, you'd either be killed by firing squad, electrocution, or lethal injection. However, in ancient India, if you committed a crime and were sentenced to death, you'd be trampled to death by a 4,000-kilogram elephant. That's like stacking 10 tracks on top of your body. This execution by elephant was as normal as the execution by guillotine in France. You would literally be dragged out to the public square after the villagers must have taken turns to beat you blue and black. There, you would be thrown into the arena by the elephant, who was always well trained in his role as executioner. And all the big guy has to do is just walk up to you and start to stamp on you. If you wanted to get even more creative, the elephants would be trained to pick up the condemned with its trunk, throw you around, break your limbs in the process, and then finish the job with their feet. If you thought roller coasters were thrilling, imagine being thrown by an elephant. The twisted part about this method of execution was that it was often reserved for royalty or people of high status because elephants were really respected in India. After all, nothing says VIP treatment quite like being smashed by an animal the size of five horses. Death by Wine, George Plantagenet 
So let's say your friend was having a pool party, and even though you had no plans of entering the water, someone sneakily pushed you in and tried to submerge you. If this has ever happened to you, then you can remember your panic and multiply that by 100. This was precisely how George Plantagenet felt when faced with his demise. So it's the 15th century in England, and George Plantagenet, who was Duke of Clarence at the time, had just been arrested for committing high treason. After getting tried in front of a court and found guilty, he was sentenced to death by his brother, King Edward IV, whom George had attempted to overthrow. The usual method of execution back then was beheading with an axe or sword, but the ever-sinister King Edward IV had other plans on how to unalive his brother. Instead of being led to the execution ground, George was taken into the wine cellar, which probably got him thinking they wanted to give him his last drink. Well, technically, uh, yes. He watched as the guards pried open a barrel of wine, but instead of handing him a cup of wine, the guards seized George and submerged his entire upper body into the barrel of wine. After struggling for a few minutes, he eventually died from drowning in a barrel of wine. This guy literally took drowning your sorrows to a whole new level. Death by self-inflicted gunshot. If you think your job is killing you, then maybe you should think about Clement Villandingham, a 19th century American lawyer and politician who quite literally died on the job. So it all started in 1871 when Clement Villandingham was defending a man accused of murder. The prosecution claims it was a clear-cut case of homicide Side, but Clement had a different theory. He's convinced the victim accidentally shot himself while drawing his pistol from his pocket. Now, most lawyers would be content with a verbal explanation of a nice diagram, but not Clement. He decided the best way to prove his point was to give a live demonstration. So there's Clement in the courtroom with a loaded gun similar to the one used in the homicide, and he's got an abundance of confidence. And he probably thought that nothing could go wrong. Well, everything, as it turns out, went horribly wrong because Clement accidentally shot himself right in the chest while demonstrating how the victim could have accidentally shot himself. Well, that was definitely a very enlightening case, and at least he proves his point. The only good thing to come out of this was that his client was acquitted based on the theory that Clement had so fatally demonstrated. So Clement Vallandingham goes down in history as the lawyer who literally killed himself to win a case. Death by DIY Parachute, Franz Reichelt. Okay, let's say you come up with this brilliant idea on how to solve world hunger or reduce global warming. It's normal to feel enthusiastic while waiting to try it out. And this is exactly what Franz Reichelt felt in 1912 when he first came up with the idea of a wearable parachute. Unfortunately, he plummeted from the new heights he thought he would achieve. You see, Franz was a professional tailor, and one day at work, he had the ultimate aha moment. He came up with the idea to invent a wearable parachute suit. Now, while well, most inventors would start by doing small experiments, like maybe wrapping a dummy in the parachute and dropping them from the second story window, Mr. Franz here decided to literally grab the bull by the horns. This guy heads to the freaking Eiffel Tower, strapped himself into his newly invented contraption, and prepares to dive. It was either you go big or go home. And unfortunately for Franz, he did both in rapid succession. There's a crowd gathered, there are cameras rolling, and the police are there, probably thinking they're about to witness history. And they were right, just not in the way anyone hoped. Franz climbed onto the railing, and as the crowd cheers him on, he jumps. For a brief, glorious moment, Franz Reichelt was flying. And then, well, let's just say gravity remembers it has a job to do. The suit, unsurprisingly, does not work, and Franz plummeted 187 feet, leaving a crater in the ground and a valuable lesson in product testing for future generations. Death by Kindness, Draco. When celebrating your birthday or a significant milestone in your life, it's normal for your family and friends to shower you with gifts and lots of love because it's your special day. Well, Draco was also showered with gifts after writing the first ever code of law in ancient Greece. However, the kindness was so much that he suffocated under it. So around 620 BCE, Draco had just finished laying down some excessively harsh and severe laws for the people of Athens 
coffins. According to this law, you'd be sentenced to death if you stole or owed someone money. These laws were later known as Draconian Laws. He's the Judge Judy of Ancient Greece if Judge Judy sentenced everyone to death. Now, you'd think that with harsh laws, the people would sharpen their knives for him. Well, no. They loved Draco's laws so much that they decided to show their appreciation in the most Athenian way possible by showering him with gifts. So there's Draco, probably feeling pretty good about himself, probably walking into the theater, and the crowd goes wild. But instead of throwing roses, they start hurling their clothes and hats at him. It's like the world's deadliest fashion show. However, things start to take a turn, the cloaks and hats pile up, and the poor lawmaker is soon trapped under a mountain of ancient Athenian swag. He couldn't crawl out due to the heavy weight of the clothes, and he ended up suffocating under all that appreciation. It's like the universe decided to teach him a lesson about excessive punishments by excessively punishing him with kindness. So, Draco goes down in history not just for his draconian laws, but for quite possibly being the only person ever loved to death in the most literal sense. There are so many more interesting absurd stories like this, and the best way to quickly access them is to join our Discord server today. Death by Tortoise, Aeschylus, Greece, 455 BC. So picture this. In ancient Greece, where drama was a high art and tragedy reigned supreme, one of history's greatest playwrights, Aeschylus, was about to star in a real-life drama that even he couldn't have scripted. And the plot twist was a tortoise with an eagle's bad aim. Aeschylus, the man credited with turning tragedy into an art form, was taking a thoughtful stroll one afternoon in 455 BC. He was probably contemplating the intricacies of fate and fortune, utterly unaware that his day was about to become an epic saga worthy of one of his own plays. Meanwhile, up above, an eagle was on a mission to find a rock to crack open a tortoise's shell for a snack. But instead of locating a rock, the eagle spotted Aeschylus's bald head, mistaking it for the perfect impact surface. The eagle, probably feeling quite proud of its aerial targeting skills, dropped the tortoise from a great height. With precision that would make a circus acrobat jealous, the eagle let go of the tortoise and down it came. The tortoise, usually just a slow-moving bundle of hard shell and mild mannerisms, transformed into a deadly projectile. It made a beeline for Aeschylus's head, turning his bald spot into the world's most unfortunate target. The impact was as dramatic as a tragic climax in one of his plays, but this time, the final curtain fell on Aeschylus for real. The tortoise's shell, which normally offered its protection, had become a fatal weapon, delivering a crushing blow that ended his life instantly. 